Oh, we're live. This is our first Mannequin Chill live stream. Um, apparently, we're going to do this every Monday, just like we do a, a recorded version of this show every Monday. I don't know why they don't get it out to the audience, um, but we record every Monday. For some reason, uh, they don't release them. But we're going to try to live stream now every week or so. Um, we don't actually have any idea what we're talking about this week. I know one thing that we won't be talking about um, is this Bears game. Um, cause it is awful. And Justin Fields is, um, he's terrible. How, how worried are you about Justin Fields? How about that? Well, hi Shane. Hey, hey Hello. Scott. Yeah. Thanks for the intro. Hello DLF. We are live on Twitter and how worried am I about Justin Fields? You know, I don't know. I, I keep looking at Jalen Hurts' season from this year and I'm like, we're gonna that's gonna be maybe close to the worst case scenario we might get for one bad season of Justin Fields next year and then maybe he doesn't have a job anymore who knows I mean he's gonna have a long leash because he was a first round pick how worried am I you know especially if in a startup you picked him in like the first round of a startup which I think both of us probably did maybe a numerous lot. times uh yeah. confessing uh our sins on here uh worried about that I mean obviously we can do a whole show about how some of that was good. Some of that was bad process. Things have changed, you know, over the course of this year. Uh, but definitely worried. But, I mean, I think most people blame it on the coaching staff. I don't know if it's necessarily just that. But, I mean, we'll see. I don't know enough about football to say for sure it is or isn't. Uh, but, yeah, I know uh, when I look at his fantasy points that they're not helping me this year, Shane. So, yes, I am worried. Well, I was going to say, you might not be a pro scout or anything, right? But I I'm sure you know enough to watch, watch him play and go, Oh, this is bad. This is not good football. Um, and yeah, just like you, um, and I blame mostly you, I picked uh, Fields in a ton of startups in like the second round um, and maybe even in the first round in some startups. I think he was going as like QB9 at one point. And uh, it hasn't gone well so far. So I'm not very excited. There's nothing you can do, right? You can't, you can't move off of him at a loss because that'd be a hell of a loss. If you could find a way to move him in another piece for, say, Josh Allen, who's coming off a horrible game, would you do that maybe? Yeah, and I think you get laughed at if you try to send fields plus pretty much anything unless it's uh, a lot that you probably don't want to trade from a process standpoint, you know, unless you're going for maybe a second-tier quarterback. I think the guys you could pivot to would be uh, – let's get your thoughts because I know you're not too keen on this player. Justin Fields – and a first for Russell Wilson in a second. Where are you at on that? I am not taking Russell Wilson. I will still take. You're uh, not a big uh, Russell Justin Wilson. Fields. No, no, I don't. I, the upgrade's not enough for me. Um, if you would have said Joe Barrow, I, I could be. You know, I would have switched my opinion from the beginning of the year where I was taking Fields over Barrow. But no, I can't do it for Russ. I just can't do it. But at least that process right there tells you that that deal is probably on the table, whether it's Burrow, whether it's Russell Wilson, maybe you want to go down to Matt Stafford for fields, yeah. something like that. I mean, the deal's potentially on the table. You know you're taking a little bit of a loss, right? It's probably a 20 to 30% loss because you're having to swap out a first and a second. Your hope is maybe that first and second bridges the gap a little bit on where those picks are if it's the same year. Uh, but there's deals to be had. I think that you have to really examine what your evaluation is on fields. And there's a way to get out. You don't want to wait another year uh, because then there could be serious questions about is he going to get potentially replaced? You know what I mean? Yeah. Is he going to get pushed out a little bit? That's, that's what you don't want. You're already seeing that with quarterbacks. People give up on these guys even while they're scoring fantasy points because they think they know what's going to happen next summer. And that's what I was going to say is uh, you don't want him being too Italian of a Lova um, who I, <laughs> I still believe in um, uh, against all available um, information, I guess, but you know, his trade market is done. Um, no one's going to give you anything near what you want um, to trade him. Um, and nor should they have to really, because he hasn't really done anything. And he, you know, with the Deshaun Watson rumors, and then again, somehow he hurt again, broke his finger, and is unable to play this week. So, yeah, you don't want to wait till next year when he's to attack Ovalova. All right. So, Shane, Justin Fields in a second or Deshaun Watson? 
I, 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 uh, <laughs> I, uh, I think I might go to Sean Watson. Um, and that, but, that is a big answer folks, because Shane was Mr. Get Deshaun Watson out of my name search, out of every one of my teams possible. And now then that, that, just, that speaks more to maybe your worry on fields a little bit versus even if you hate Watson, if he comes back, you can probably cash out for more than what you just paid to get him. You know what I mean? That's a value yeah. trade versus it is, you know, your, your evaluation specifically on Watson, the person or fields, the player. So, I mean, what do you have to add to Trey Lance or what do you have to add to fields to get Trey Lance? I don't, I think too much to make it a, value, a good trade. Um, whereas Great. Justin Fields is almost kind of like not even bringing value to that trade. Um, Cause I, well, I predicted think- this with Trey Lance and I said, he's actually going to gain value because he doesn't play. Right. People are going to be enamored with, and especially cause we saw him early. We saw him run in a touchdown. We saw him pass for a touchdown. We saw him get to start one game. And of course he ran for 90 yards. So people are going nuts. Like, Hey, this guy's his floor. And I happen to agree. I think Jalen hurts. What he's doing this year is like what you're going to see out of Trey Lance minimum for like two seasons. You know what I mean? Like that's the floor. Even if he doesn't develop and he's essentially just Jalen hurts, if he's allowed to run like he has, he's got a really good floor. You know what I mean? But the fact that he hasn't played, his value, I feel like, has held better than all the other rookies because he hasn't played. You know what I mean? Like, there's still like this mystique about Trey Lance. Justin Fields has been exactly what we wanted, basically the starter since day one or week two. And okay, his value is in the tank now because he's played and he hasn't been good. So it's just interesting how Lance, by not playing, his value seems to be like slowly holding and even rising the more that it builds towards him taking over. Yeah, one of the things with Fields is, and I've said this about um, Urban Meyer in Jacksonville and what he's done to the fantasy assets there. We knew it would be bad, right? We we knew it would be bad. We didn't, I don't think anyone comprehended how bad. Um, even though we just saw this, this same story play out with Mitch Trubisky, who you know, he, Obviously, you could argue is is not as talented as a prospect as Justin Fields, but either way, he he was a high draft pick. A lot was expected of him, and we just saw the same story with Matt Nagy. And for whatever reason, I know I did. We went, man, it'll be different this time, Um, because I think part of us, uh, at least part of the community, and we at least some of the blame we thought was Mitch Trubisky's. Um, where now I look at Mitch Trubisky and I go, I wonder what he could have been under a decent, um, coach because Matt Nagy is just pure poison. Um, best case scenario is Matt Nagy gets fired this year. And I don't know that that's going to happen. Um, I, I, the one thing about Trey Lance is, you know, you mentioned that he'll be like Jalen Hurts, except that we'll know that the starting job is his the following year. Um, so, you know, if he has a Jalen Hurts season, next season where you're a little concerned because the passing's not there. You don't have to be so concerned because you know, he's going to at least get another year at it. Whereas Jalen hurts. It looks like the Eagles have already gone. Oh, okay. We know what he's good at. And it's, um, it's, it's not doing anything where we put the game in his hands. So he's definitely not going to be here next year. You, you won't have to worry about that with Lance at least. Well, that was the idea with Lance is like people are still paying Jalen Hurts for they're still paying a first for Jalen Hurts to have him just for the rest of the year because he's a top six fantasy quarterback. And I think that's the floor with Trey Lance. I mean, and there could be a higher ceiling, too. But at least, like you said, there's some insulation with his job for multiple years. So that's part of the reason why his value has held. It's just he's he's done just enough to draw people in at this basically the same rate that he was going in rookie drafts all the other quarterbacks around him have started to erode. So it's just, it's just interesting that if I would have told you before the season, the guy that doesn't play much this year, if not at all, except for one game when the starter was hurt. So he didn't even earn the job. Basically the starter had to be out for him to play. That guy would be the highest valued of all the rookie quarterbacks. I'm, I don't think people would have bought that, but that's exactly what we're seeing take place. So it's very interesting. Yeah, it was a disconnect where we knew Matt Nagy was bad, right? We knew Urban Meyer was going to be an absolute clown show. And we assumed the Jets were going to be bad, right? Um, but again, it's it's almost like we thought 
the rookies could overcome this. I don't know why. I don't know what gave us this this belief. I think it was just mostly hope that they were so talented that they could overcome um, coaches that apparently, best I can tell, are actively working against them. I mean, I don't I don't think they're doing that. But if you told me they were, like if it came out, like if there was an email that came out that uh, said Matt Nagy was purposely sabotaging Justin Fields, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but it, it's still, I guess it was hard to comprehend how badly he would hurt him. Um, and then the fact that, you know, we talked about, we thought he'd be okay because he had Allen Robinson um, and Darnell Mooney. Like that, that was, that's his receiving core. And um, Allen Robinson, I know everyone loves him and everyone wants to blame Fields for it, but Allen Robinson's not getting open. If you look at his separation per target, he's never open, um, which isn't great for a rookie quarterback. And Darnell Mooney is okay as maybe, I don't know, the fourth option on an offense. I don't know that he should be the second or first option on any offense. And Cole Komet, does he still play football? I haven't heard from him lately. So I, I don't really know if he's of any use. So, you know, I guess – we looked at, or at least I know I did. I looked at the rose-colored version of how this would go. That Matt Nagy wasn't as bad as I thought he was. It must have been Mitch Trubisky. Allen Robinson is Allen Robinson. Darnell Mooney's going to take a step in the second year and be a legitimate weapon. And obviously, Cole Komet is going to be a, a weapon on the offense. But it just not has has not happened. Um, and none of that's to excuse how bad Justin Fields has been because he has been absolutely awful. Couldn't have said it better myself, my friend. So uh, from coaches potentially sabotaging quarterbacks to quarterbacks sabotaging their own careers, let's talk a little bit. Sam Darnold. I had a debate um, on our Patreon channel, uh, on our Patreon podcast earlier today. Sam Darnold's dynasty value, when I really looked at it, we, we went through... 35 quarterbacks at least that we would take over Sam Darnold. And that includes the likes of Jordan Love, Mitchell Trubisky, Teddy Bridgewater, basically anybody that hasn't blown their second opportunity, if not more. Because I think at this point, I mean, Sam Darnold has been so bad that I, I don't see an outcome where he is a starter next year. I think he's going to at best have to go on like a Jameis Winston tour where he literally goes back to the drawing board and tries to completely reboot his career. He'll get another opportunity because he was a high draft pick. Like he's going to get signed. He'll get many chances, but the keys actually handed to him where, where there's any value spike possible or even a value floor. Uh, I think it's over. So I, I basically said he's Mitch Trubisky from last year where the entire community gave up on him. If you remember about halfway through the season, he was dead. You couldn't even trade him for a third yet. He's the starter on a team. You know, he was still starting games, but you're going, I won't give you anything because it's a foregone conclusion. He's gone after this year. He will not be a starter. Do you feel the same with Darnold? I mean, is that where we're at that far down after a hot start? I mean, literally a month later, is it that bad? Yeah. And you know, it's funny about that though, is with the Trubisky, um, like taking Trubisky over Darnold now it's be partly because <laughs> now that I've seen Justin Fields under the Matt Nagy tutelage, I think Trubisky's better than we thought, but yeah, Sam Darnold is, um, terrible. He is absolutely God awful. He was getting carried the first what three weeks based off of rushing touchdowns. He had five rushing touchdowns or something like that in the first three games. Um, and we've seen him completely regress and completely fall apart. I don't even know that he could be a backup in this league at this point, the way he plays. And even if he is a backup, I don't think he could be a valuable backup. You know, there's certain backups in, in, um, in fantasy football and even in super flex leagues that were just like, no, I'm not going to pick that guy up. That's okay. Like Joe Flacco, when he got traded to the jets. And even though he was seemingly the next guy up there after Mike white, I, I wouldn't have made a move for him. Sam Darnold has entered that realm for me, like where I'm at the point where I wouldn't even want to start him if I was forced to, that I would go, nah, let me throw a running back in there. Let me throw a wide receiver. At least they have more upside than Darnold. Um, so he's pretty much gone. He's done. And he's kind of a case study in if a player is bad their first three seasons and then has uh, three good weeks and rebuild some of that value, it might be time to move off of them as quickly as possible. Yeah, and it's crazy that we're down to the Trubisky over Darnold debate, but you can argue that uh, you laid it out perfectly. Even if I have Sam Darnold and he is quote-unquote a starter, 
in my portfolio where I could maybe hit his name to put him in the lineup. I'm really not even confident that's going to give me top 24 quarterback production. So it's to the point where I had a league this weekend, no joke, true two QB league. Okay. You have to start two quarterbacks. And I think I told you this already, but I have to start two quarterbacks, 12 team league. So there's some scarcity there, right? Not everyone has two starters. Not everybody has extra starters to throw out there during a bye week. And I have Sam Darnold. And so I threw him out there going, man, I'm, I'm lucky. At least I have a guy that's going to start. You know, I locked him in because he came off his concussion. He was in the lineup. I'm excited. And I'm playing the worst team in the league. And he doesn't have two quarterbacks. So guess who he starts? Because he has nobody else. He starts P.J. Walker on the other side. You know, and P.J. Walker doesn't even play, really. And he still outscores Sam Darnold. So that's how bad it is to where if I have him and I have any other option. That's how bad he's been from a production standpoint. Like any backup quarterback that's getting a job for a week is in over him. Like it's that bad. So yeah, Trubisky's going to probably get another shot. Uh, we'll see what he's learned this year in, in Buffalo and you know, where does he go? Who gives him a shot? He's probably going to be somebody that's a bridge quarterback competing with the team that drafts a quarterback or something like that, but he's going to get a shot quicker than Sam Darnold. So I think the fact that Sam Darnold is still, like actively probably starting, at least for now. Um, I think you can trade him for Trubisky, but you're shooting pretty low. You might be able to even get like a third round pick on top of it or something. J just, but it's that bad. Like that's a win if you can get a third in Trubisky for Darnold. Like that's a win. Yeah, you can and, get any, honestly, anything for Darnold in a super flex league. I, I get it. And that's the only reason you'll get anything is because you can go, well, guys, it's a super flex. He's still starting. And someone's going to go, yeah, you're right. And you're going to go, well, yeah, but he's going to give you eight points at quarterback and you're going to start him over a running back who could probably give you 11 points. So you're automatically going to lose every time you put him in there. So yeah, I'll take whatever you want to give me back. Fine. You want to give me a third. And like you said, Mitchell Trubisky, although I probably shoot higher upside, somebody like Chad Henney, but either way. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> someone All right. Dar like Darnold that. or golf. Um, they almost golf. feel like the same thing, don't they? But at least golf, like golf, you, be, golf. Okay, I can see golf being a bench, uh, a, a backup after this year. Okay. Um, but I can see him putting up starts, spot starts where he's actually valuable. Right. I don't know that Sam Darnold is ever going to give you a spot start where he's valuable again. Well, maybe, golf can golf maybe. can give you the random like thirty for forty game where he hits three yards per completion. You know what I mean? Like he can give you like a volume game where. He just checked down, check down, right. check down, and, and can somehow get to like 18 points. You know, like Darnold, it's it's there's risk that you get single digits when you throw him in there. So or negative or negative. Yeah, or or negative. Or negative. I mean, uh just watching him yesterday, um, before Robbie Anderson yelled at him on the sidelines on the interception, he threw to DJ towards DJ Moore, because it wasn't to DJ Moore, like DJ Moore was playing um defensive back on the play, he just swatted at the ball. But it was just the most, the most like on the run, nonchalant, like flick of the wrist. He's got a nice arm. I'll give him that, man. Nice arm. No idea where it's going. Um, flick of the wrist right to the DB. Um, he's just he's just washed. And then today, you know, it came out that they want to look at his shoulder on an MRI because I think they're looking for any excuse they can to just sit him for PJ Walker. And it's so bad is uh, I actually put in a waiver wire for Eno Benjamin. Um early this morning and I wasn't paying attention. And then I realized, Oh wait, I'm dropping PJ Walker for, you know, Benjamin. I can't do that. Cause PJ Walker is going to be starting in a week and a half. Yeah. I think to trade, to trade Darnold at this point, to try to get another starter back, even if it is literally the golf Bridgewater range, I mean, Bridgewater's a, a smash, but if, yeah. even if it's the bottom, bottom, bottom tier, I don't even want to do that. I would rather target, Literally, if I can get any second, it's an easy accept. But I think another deal is if you can get a second plus insert backup quarterback that you think is going to get another shot, Trubisky, Mariota, Jameis Winston even. I would I would trade Darnold for Winston straight up Yeah, knowing that Winston – was pretty efficient this year. As long as he can recover from his ACL, he will get another shot. So, but that's how bad it is. I would trade Darnold for Winston straight up. Obviously I'd try for more, but I mean, that's where you're at. If you can get, you know, one of those backups back plus a pick, like it, just do it. 
just do it because you can already see the writing on the wall on his future value. What else is on your mind, bud? That's it. I, and I agree. And I was going to say, hey, that's a live stream. That's 20 minute manic and chill talking about. I had one other thing I want to mention if you didn't have a topic. Damn it. Go ahead. I mean, heck, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is an important topic. This is where you're really getting into the reason we're doing this live stream is we're going to really start talking some theory. Okay. Oh. So we're going to cut this at 10 minutes. I promise we're not going to go over 30 because that's, that's what we've uh, kind of been told to do. But you know, if, we, if left our own devices, we would live stream for like three hours. But here's the idea. Let's assume the listeners right now are sitting on a team you're about to go nine and zero. You're about to go eight and one. You're about to go seven and two. Any of those three records, those records make you smile when you see those, don't they, Shane? Mm -hmm. When your team's a big nine and zero or eight and one or seven and two. Yeah, that, those leagues I'm very good at fantasy football, and it has nothing to do with luck. Those are the ones you brag about on Twitter and talk about how you won the championship, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you don't have to disclose that you are in 48 leagues nope. and that was the one you won yep. and went undefeated. Yep. Okay. okay. But let's say you're in the – this is, I think, next-level thinking when it comes to Dynasty, okay? You have a 9-0 and o team. Let's just assume it's one of these that's a start 10 or start 11, not some of these mega deal, mega leagues we're in where it's start 14 or start 15. Okay, it's, it's reasonable, okay? 12 teams start 10. Do you look at those teams and say, where can I trade away win-now pieces? Where can I kind of trade away some extra depth, take a little more risk, knowing that I'm holding a bunch of pieces probably that I know their value is not going to be insulated. Hey, I have this extra receiver. Hey, I have, you know, two or three good running backs, but I also have James Conner and he's now going to start for the next month. Like, do you look at those teams and say, Hey, even though I'm the contender, I'm eight and one. Oh, Scott, you're seven and two. You need a running back. Okay. How about you trade me the market price for this running back and I'll give him to you and I'll just take the risk that I can still beat you with what I have. But man, if you can win and you're able to pick up some liquidated assets for next year, I think that's how you can truly excel and build dynasties. Do you think about that? Do you look at your good teams in that regard? Or do you just I, say, I'm hoarding every good player I have? Nobody's nobody's moving. Well, I do. But yeah, so that's what I was going to say. I'm big on hoarding. Um because look, when I want to build and when I want to accrue assets is in, in the off season. Um, once the season comes, I, I want them. Like I don't want to give them up. And I understand, you know, the the point. Well, James Conner is not going to have value after, well, probably in four weeks, after six weeks, whenever Chase Edmonds comes back. Obviously, he's not going to have whatever value I could get for him now. But those aren't the guys I want to move in season, unless you know, unless I'm in the complete opposite realm like i'm at the bottom of the the league if i'm if i'm a winner i want to destroy everyone i don't want to help anyone get any wins ever um because it would be my absolute horror show that i'd end up seeing that guy in the finals and james connor would run for 250 yards and four touchdowns on me and uh i won't remember the uh second two second round draft picks that i made you know when i traded connor um I mean, I get your point and I get, you know, why you should do it because of, you know, you should be trading. You should be always selling your trade high assets because that's how you build really rock solid rosters. Right. In theory, because you're going to keep you're going to keep churning those things until you turn two second round players into a first round player, until you turn two mediocre players into a really good player, et cetera, et cetera. Except that it never works like that in fantasy football because, you know, I hate saying the word luck because things happen because injuries happen. I mean, you know, just look at the, the amount of running backs that we've had to start this year. Uh, Jordan Howard, um, Devontae Freeman that we never thought we were going to have to start. Um, so if I've got them on my roster, I'm fine with holding them knowing, knowing that they're going to have literally no value in about two more months. If that, well, let me give you a hypothetical. So let's assume Chase Edmonds is out. He's got a high ankle sprain, a legit high ankle sprain. So to, to think he's going to be even right in the four week minimum time frame, I think is pretty optimistic. I mean, I, I would say effectively in terms of, is he going to physically be back on the field? Maybe week 15 or week 16, maybe, but especially if James Conner continues to roll, is he going to be somebody you're going to be relying on in your playoffs? Probably no. So I'm just going to say, uh, effectively, he might be out for the fantasy season, right? To where you're going to trust him. 
So let's say you're riding right now. You have a really good team. Your opponent, who also is a contender, lost Chase Edmonds, who was his RB2 or RB3, okay? You're riding Elijah Mitchell as your RB3. You also have James Conner. So you're working with some depth, and you just look at your opponent, and his Chase Edmonds loss was your James Conner gain, right? So now he comes to you, and he goes, Shane, I need a running back. Now you know you have this guy bent over the barrel, right? Like, he has no running backs. You just got an extra one because his guy went down. That's the best case scenario. That's why you don't handcuff your own guys. That's the outcome you want. Now, he says he'll give you a first. Sold. <laughs> not for James Conner. Uh, Elijah Mitchell. Okay. He can have James Conner. Nope. Nope. He Khalil wants, he Herbert. doesn't want, he doesn't want to buy James Conner. He wants to buy Elijah Mitchell. But you wouldn't have traded him for a first last week. But now that you have James Conner, you're staring at that first going, man, I can get that first. Maybe I can still beat him with James Conner. He'll even throw Chase Edmonds back in the deal for you. Yeah, that's feeling too cute by half. Um, And and again, I get the theory behind it, except that you're going to trade Elijah Mitchell and James Conner is going to immediately break his shin um, because that's what the fantasy gods uh, so choose. I, I'd have to get the pulse of the rest of my league. Like that's one of those ones where I'd probably start sending feelers out to other people before I pulled that trade off. Like, Hey, if I happen to have a first and this additional asset, what could I get from you? Uh, bottom feeder, uh, you of the, in the, you know, the bottom four teams. Um, I'd probably start poking around them and see what I could get for a first or maybe even two first. Do they have a Nick Chubb? that I could maybe add something to that first I'm getting for Mitchell. And then I can turn Mitchell into Nick Chubb, even though I have to give up a little bit more Do something like that. Yeah, that's fine. But you're going to have to, you really need to start poking around at your other league mates and and without telling them exactly where you're getting this asset from, just let them know, Hey, I'm going to have this asset. It's going to be here shortly. How do you feel about taking a couple seconds for, or excuse me, a couple firsts for Nick Chubb or Ezekiel Elliott or something like that? Yeah, this is a this is a good debate. This is something that I've really been thinking about. I'm going to try it with some of my better teams, and because because here's where I think the true edge is: trades are hard enough to get done in leagues. I mean, there's been so many deals this year where I think I can maybe get a deal in a league, and then half the league just doesn't respond or doesn't go fast enough for my liking, I have to move on, or you leave a trade up and it sounded great last week and then this week happened and I go, eh, glad he didn't accept that or glad I revoked all those offers before the game started. Uh, But sometimes you just can't get deals done. I do think that, like you said, part of the idea of making a deal like that is what else can I buy with that first? That's part of the advantage, right? Let's say you get that first for Elijah Mitchell. You now have that first in your back pocket. What if a tanking team in two weeks is now willing to sell another player better than Mitchell for a first? You just won, right? Because you have the flexibility of the asset. The next thing is, what if James Conner stays healthy for four or five weeks? Maybe you need another running back along the way, but you don't necessarily have to spend a first to get it. Maybe week 14 comes up and it's we don't like trade deadlines, but let's say there's a trade deadline and someone's offering that week's Dearness Johnson for a third. You buy that just to supplement for one week. But you may end up having no less of a shot to win that championship and you just bank that extra first. And you're feeling great going into the offseason. That's the goal. The goal is to still win, but I kind of have this obsession of trying to win on the slimmest of margins. I don't want to win with the most stacked roster but half my assets are not even in my lineup during championship week. And maybe that's kind of like a utopian idea, but that's something I'm going to play around with. Cause I mean, if you have a stacked roster, you know, the, you're, there are pieces I guarantee on all of our win now teams, all of our stack teams that we know the value floor is gone in six weeks. It's yeah, done. See that's, and we can get into this a little more later, but that, that's why when you build your rosters and when you make trades, you have to actively look at what type of team and what type of assets you're holding. Sure. Like, is everyone on your team Devontae Adams, who's a great win now piece? But come the summertime, when you know you're in trade mode, you're not going to ever get fair value for him. Um, and in two years, 
because you couldn't get fair value for him, you either traded him at a loss or you held on to him and your team um, has disintegrated all at one time. So that's why you have to keep, you know, varying assets on your roster. And that's why Mannequin Chill is done for the evening. We did our first live stream. No one joined us. Um, maybe we'll try to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Promote it next week. That's what we'll do. Yeah. And, um, I'm, I'm not even quite sure if it worked good, but we'll see. I mean, we'll see. We'll get, uh, we'll get some feedback on whether it worked or not, but we'll continue to try to live stream. Um, we always say every week, but who knows, but if we do, it's going to be sometime on Monday nights during the Monday night football game. Uh, we'll throw the link up on the DLF Twitter. Shane and I'll share it on our accounts. That should hopefully hit. You know, quite a few people that are just kind of sitting around browsing Twitter, watching the game, want to jump on, take some questions, take some topics, uh, a lot to talk about over the next couple months. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and sign off for myself at Charles Chill FFB. Shane, where are you? At Shane is the worst. And yes. as you can tell, my son's bedroom. Yeah, different setup in the background. I like yeah. it. I like it. Dynasty Trades HQ, Dynasty and Chill at DL Football on Twitter. Uh, check out the website, sign up for DLF. It's great. It has a lot of tools. Click on the link below, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and we will be back maybe next week, maybe the week after for another Mannequin Show. Good night, DLF. Good night, DLF.